welcome to Mimamsa Foundation for Indic Studies second Justice Ranade Memorial Lecture. Mimamsa Foundation for Indic Studies is a forum where we attempt to provide well researched object objective and authentic perspective to understand India in a well rooted Indian way. What we mean by Indian way is that we believe that India with its distinct socio civilizational character must be studied with those uh, socio political and civilizational realities and unless we sort of treat india with those realities understanding india will always be incomplete this broadly goes today by the name indic studies or indic perspectives uh, we at mimamsa do that through well researched articles lecture series video interviews and to expand our initiatives since last year mimamsa foundation for indic studies constituted justice ranade memorial lecture this is the second edition of Justice Standard Memorial Lecture, and we are delighted to have uh, Professor Pankaj Jain with us. At the outset, let me also thank uh, Ranade Realtors from Pune, who have uh, generously supported uh, this Memorial Lecture initiative. Uh, we therefore want to thank our sponsors for that. I'll briefly uh, introduce our speaker today. Professor Jain is currently head of the Department of Humanities and Languages and also the chair of India Center at Flame University, Pune. Earlier, he was a founding co-chair of India Initiative, uh, an associate professor at the Department of Philosophy and Religion and Anthropology at the University of North Texas. He is also a PhD from University of Iowa and an MA from Columbia University, both in religious studies. He recently co-edited volume, India and the Western Philosophical Concepts in Religion, he has also compiled Jain and Hindu history in America for his monograph titled Dharma in America, a short history of Hindu and Jain diaspora. He is also author of an award-winning Dharma and Ecology of Hindu Communities, Sustenance and Sustainability, and Science and Socio-Religious Revolution in India, Moving the Mountains. I'm, I'm extremely delighted uh, to formally welcome Professor Jain uh, to this second Justice Sanade Memorial Lecture. Uh, thank you, Professor Jain, for accepting the invitation and joining us today. Thank you, Akshay. Thank you for taking this initiative. We really need more and more people like you and your foundations who can do and do some Indic-oriented research and spread these ideas because we have been missing these ideas for the last 75 years or probably more within India, and we really need to spread these ideas. So <clears throat> let's start. I'll start with my presentation. So I'll start with my presentation. I'll start my presentation with noting that the title India and Indology through Dharma and Dharmic Categories. I, as, I, as you noted in my bio, I come from religious studies background. So my focus or my orientation, my research has been studying India, I mean, to study India from dharmic or dharma categories, not religious categories. That is what is my focus. That is what I'll, I'll attempt to present. Uh, also, before going ahead, I should note that there has been a, one pioneering book, at least, uh, that was written probably at least more than 30 years back. That was an edited volume by Professor Mackie Marriott of Chicago University, University of Chicago. That was called as India Through Hindu Categories. But after that, uh, very little progress has been made to develop Indic categories to study India or maybe other cultures also. So my research is a small, humble attempt in that direction. Like you noted, we need Indic categories to study India, Indology. So that is what I will attempt to present in my presentation and how I have been using some of these categories to study some of the phenomena that we have in India, environmental phenomena and so on, as I'll show you. All right, so, <clears throat> so uh, before we progress, proceed further, we have to note that how exactly is dharma different from religion? So if we apply religious religion pa paradigm to study India, how that would be an injustice to Indi Indic uh, study and how dharma or dharmic categories can be better way to study India. So before we proceed, let's study dharma itself and dharma, let's try to define dharma because we have to remind ourselves, even though it's part of our all our Indian languages, including Marathi, which is your language, I guess, and Hindi and, and Kannada, Tamil, Telugu, Bengali, Assamia, every Indian language has a prominent word, dharma, which is used by all people of all languages in India, across India. 
And what are the different meanings that people use, people apply to this word dharma? Dharma, of course, means religion. It also means customary observances, law usage, practice, religious or moral merit, virtue, righteousness, duty, justice, piety, morality, and sacrifice. These are just some of the meanings that are in the dictionary by Monier Williams or even Apte dictionary that we use Sanskrit to English dictionary dictionaries. So dharma itself has wide ranging meaning and why it has so many meanings and how what are the implications of all these meanings what it does to India, study of India or Indic studies or Indology, that is what we will see. But let's see more of uh, the of interpretations of dharma in different texts of India. And so let's start with uh, what Paul Hecker and Wilhelm Elphas noted about dharma. So they come from European perspective, German perspective, German Indologists. Both noticed that Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyaya's dharma tattva and also after him, Aurobindo Ghosh and Tagore, Ravina Tagore and Mahatma Gandhi and Vinoba Bhave, they all attempted to develop the dharma paradigm and try to apply that to Indian society. But what Hacker and Elphas note is that their attempt to develop dharma was influenced by European civilization, European theories, and underlying that is the Christian theory of uh, Protestant ideology to do charity for global good to spread ideas globally. So what Hacker and Elphas note is that dharma was developed by recent 19th century, 18th century scholars and leaders in India, but they were all influenced by European ideas. So they call them neo-Hindus. So they take dharma as a very recent neo-Hindu attempt to develop as a replica or as an influence from Christianity and so it's a very recent phenomenon from Hacker and Helfer's perspective. And they are extremely influential, especially Wilhelm Helfer's has been extremely influential scholar, Indologist for the last 30 years. His, his book came, Europe and India, and that has, been, has remained extremely influential book, of course, in, in the West, but also indirectly it influences the study of India, even in India. So that is their major critique of the word dharma itself. So in my work, in my publication, my first book, I responded to that criticism by noticing that Guru Jambeshwar, who never studied English, and I mean, he was born in 1451 to 1536. There was no English that time in India, so there was no European influence, right? Yet when he speaks about dharma in archaic, antique Rajasthani language, he was in Rajasthan in desert area. He was the guru leader of the Bishnoi community that he founded. So in my first book, what I show, what I show in my work is that Guru Jambeshwar, when he uses the word dharma, he uses in an ethical sense, exactly like how Bankim Chand Chattopadhyay or Aurobindo Ghosh or Tagore or Gandhi or Vinoba Bhave developed it as an ethical concept, as a universal principle in 18th, 19th, 20th century. Similarly, Guru Jambeshwar did that in the 15th century. So it cannot be a European influence when dharma is equated with ethics. That is the first point to respond to European uh, Elphas and Hacker's allegation that dharma is a very recent phenomenon, that it's a it's an influence of Christian or European theories. So that is the first point I want to make here. Now, if you go back, go to the origin of the word dharma, we know the root of dharma is dhri. Dhri means to sustain, support, and hold. Right? This, this, these are the meanings of dharma. Now, dhri, sustain, support, or hold. So in the Vedas, we know that they say, these are the sayings, prithivim dharmana, Dhritam, the Prithvi, earth, is supported by dharma. Right? Similarly, in the Rig Veda, in the Purush Sukta, Tani, dhar, tani Dharmani, Prathmani Asan. In the, so in that line, in Purush Sukta, 1090, dharma replaces the word Ritam. So Purush Sukta being a real later edition, dharma replaces Ritam. Ritam simply meant cosmic or ecological rhythm. So in my opinion, even rit, rhythm word in English may be cognate with Ritam in Sanskrit, ancient Vedic Sanskrit, right? And so Ritam is replaced by Dharma in the Purush Sukta in the Rig Veda. So even there, Dharma is, is accepted, Dharma is mentioned, and Dharma is interpreted to mean cosmic or ecological rhythm. So we see Dharma as a universal principle, even in the Vedas. Dharma means to sustain support. And what is, what is it supporting in the, in the Rig Veda, especially here? 
is that it supports the entire cosmic ecological rhythm. It maintains the uh, sunrise and sun setting. It maintains the planets. It maintains Prithvi, the earth. It means it maintains universal rhythm. It means it, it sustains the universal uh, cosmos. So that is the grand idea of dharma, not just a recent 18th, 19th century phenomenon. It's an ancient Vedic concept. Right? It's uh, using Vedas and using Jambeshwar's writings in, in uh, words in Rajasthani. I try to show that dharma is a universal concept. It's universalistic concept, not just a recent phenomenon. All right. Now, <clears throat> if we try to see more definitions of dharma, we know that Purva Mimansa Sutra by Jamini says that Chodana Lakshanortho Dharmaha in Jamini Sutra 1.1, 1, 1. which means that Vedic instructions are the means to understand and practice dharma. That is a direct cause of the good, Shreyaskar, that is desirable. So dharma signifies virtues and righteousness even in later texts such as the Jamini Sutra. Then in Buddhism and Jainism, in Jainism, most famously, Jains have declared Ahimsa as Paramo Dharma or Kevali Panattam Dhammam Saranam Pavajami or Sahu Dhamma. Here, Dharma simply means that the highest ethical principle is Ahimsa. That is the first line. Second is, I take refuge in the teachings of the people who are liberated, who have attained Moksha. Those are the Kevalis. Kevalis means the, those who are already liberated, who have attained Moksha. What they have taught, I take refuge in their teachings. And that is the Sahu Dhamma. Sadhu or Sahu means the noble people or liberated people. And their dharma is what I accept or, or I take refuge into. Then in Buddhism, we know that Buddha defined dharma as his teachings and also rules and laws for the Buddhist community. So dharmam saranam gachami means I take refuge in Buddha, I take refuge in Sangha, and I take refuge in dharma or dharma, so which means teachings or rules, uh, teachings and rules and laws of the Buddhist community. So that is the Buddhist definition of dharma. So we see this wider, wide-ranging implications, interpretations, meanings of the word dharma in different contexts is what I'm trying to show, show here. Now, if we go to later texts such as uh, in the Mahabharat uh, we, we, and other dharma sutras, so Van Buitenen, a, a Dutch scholar in 1957, he published this quotation of uh, one of his writings and, and I got this quotation from his writings is that all the four Purusharthas are also mere branches of dharma. So artha, kama and dharma should not be deemed to refer to distinct different practices. In principle, all three are dharma. So dharma again is an over, overarching principle paradigm that includes even artha, kama and moksha and uh, dharma, artha and kama. And of course, moksha is the final result of practicing dharma throughout one's life and by while, while pursuing different purusharthas. Then in the Mahabharata 12th, 1, 1, 10, 11th verse, there is a saying uh, by in the Mahabharata which, which says, Dharna dharma iti ahur dharmana dharmena vidhartha prajaha yat syad dharna syam yuktam sa dharma iti nishchayaha. Dharma is the principle that sustains this worldly affairs and the other worldly affairs. Again, it's a wide ranging concept, universalistic concept, on uh, almost in the sense of cosmological rhythm that we what we saw in the Rig Veda. All right. Then the next line is also from the Mahabharat, <coughs> which is very very common and very popular. Everybody knows this. Yada yada hi dharma se glanir bhavti bharata abhyutthanam adharma se. So here again, dharma is that ethical principle or spiritual cultural phenomenon that if it it degrades itself then the universal con consciousness takes a uh, manifested form and it tries to re-establish itself as we all know this very commonly. Then this image, if you take a look, Yato Dharmaha Tato Jayaha, that is coming from Indian constitution, which means wherever, wherever there is Dharmaha, there, 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 right there is the victory, right there is the success. And even the last line of the Bhagavad Gita has the same meaning. All right. Then so also Bhagavad Gita says, Imperfect Swadharma is better than perfect. Even perfect Paradharma is to be is to be not is not to be preferred. But even imperfect Swadharma is better than Paradharma. Right. So Dharma again here is an ethical duty, virtue, principle, and so on. It's it's connected with again universalistic interpretations. One more definition. This is from Karnad's Vaisheshika Sutra, where it says Yato Bhudaya Nishre Nishreshaya Siddhi Sa Dharmaha. That which leads to attainment of well-being and the highest good is dharma. That is Karnad's Vaisheshika Sutra. Again, one more definition where it says, 
that dharma leads to attainment of well-being of everybody of the entire universe and that is the highest good and that is dharma again universalistic phenomenon so what does it mean so <clears throat> uh, uh before going even deeper into interpretation let me let's see one more definition this is from ramayan from the ramayan where dharma is defined as the truth righteousness strenuous strenuous of effort compassion for creatures and kindly words reverence for brahmins gods and guests right so atithi deva bhava and so on those are all part of dharma also and that is what is demonstrated by the behavior conduct of lord ram shri ram prabhu ram in ramayana so that's rama itself lord rama itself himself is the seed of dharma his conduct is a is a role model for dharma how dharma is to be practiced <clears throat> now by all of these interpretations what we can learn is the dharma is that universal phenomenon that connects of course with the interpretation of religion but it also connects with the interpretation of duty or ethical ideas or ethical practices dharma also connects with physical properties so we know that there is agni dharma there is vriksha dharma there is uh, prithvi dharma and so on so every physical object has its own physical characteristic and that is also defined as dharma so in that sense i was using this word universalistic so dharma has this universalistic interpretation that connects with spirituality that connects with ethics and that connects with ecological properties and then so so dharma is that <clears throat> is that fine intersecting point very subtle uh, intersecting point that is an overlap with supernatural world because it's spiritual idea it connects with human world because it's ethical idea and also it connects with natural world because it it is a physical char- characteristic also dharma is defined as physical characteristic also now so dharma in that sense in these two senses uh, so linguistic sense uh, waitman and pande there were there are two linguists in the in european uh, uh, study research they found that all indian languages use dharma in these different senses of religion and duty and property so it, it's it's a overarching transcendental uh, word in that sense in linguistics in languages indian languages dharma also is a overarching paradigm because in parajoli parajoli's research he found that dharma is what connects with supernatural world human world and natural world so combining the linguistic model and an ethical model we come to conclusion that also is noted by ariel gruklich in 1994 in his work what he noted matches with my conclusion is that dharma is a as a body mind environmental gestalt what does that mean what does that mean that means that dharma when when people when especially hindu people in india when they are let's say taking a holy dip in the river ganga or ganges in english or ganga they are they are trying to transcend the boundaries that are led by their body or mind or even their environment so dharma tra- help them transcend in everyday practices as a psychological phenomenon that connects them with ancient experiences that must have been uh, experienced by ancient people or their rishis their yogis in which they transcended their body mind divisions in which they transcended their local environment in which they transcended transcended even their mind so that is why hindus are doing all these rituals they go to different places for pilgrimage and so on because dharma as a principle as a practice helps them transcend and experience the transcendental phenomenon of enlightenment a glimpse of enlightenment a glimpse of even moksha a freedom from everyday experiences that is what is dharma as defined by <coughs> ariel gruklich and that matches in these two figures also because it transcends all these boundaries of physical realities now let's keep going so dharma in in quoting two more scholars here and apologies uh, professor ann gold and she noticed in her research in rajasthan that human behaviors are irrevocably interwoven with the natural environment's condition so the deterioration of one implies and involves the other so as if ecology is degrading let's say in a village in rajasthan people interpret it, interpret it to mean that if they are not living by dharmic principles their environment also also suffers and vice versa if environment is suff- is degrading if trees are being cut that is a reflection of human greed so again dharma is used as a word to interpret that ecological phenomenon and ethical practices are interconnected that is what she noted in her work in rajasthan 
And then I note from Frederick Smith's work in 2006, he quotes um, uh, Mackie Marriott and Ronald Inden that I quoted in the beginning, Mackie Marriott's uh, book, uh, India Through Hindu, Hindu Categories, and Ronald Indian, his, his book is Imagining India, both at University of Chicago, now retired. And then Arjun Appadurai's word, words also he quotes in his work in Frederick Smith, that in Indian context, and largely non-Western context, the difference between mind and body, a difference between culture and nature is of degree rather than of kind. What he means by that is that it's a, it's a, it's a continuous spectrum or continuum where people don't really make di uh, any distinction or boundary between nature or culture, between mind or body. And how they use this as a continuum is the idea of, again, the word dharma. So what I'm, what I've been uh, deducing or, uh, or, or suggesting is that the idea of dharma, the principle of dharma is a must required principle to study India. Because if you study India's environment, you have to bring in dharma. If you want to study India's ethical phenomena, you have to bring in dharma. If you want to study India's spiritual practices, you have to think from dharmic perspective. Because if we apply religion as a category, then we are already making distinction between ethics and spirituality and ecology. But if we bring in dharma as a, as a category, we are interchangeably using this one word or one principle to study all the different phenomena or across Indian society, across Indian environmental conditions, nature, and so on. That has been what, has, what I've been uh, suggesting, what I've been, uh, I've been suggesting in my publications and even here in this webinar. All right, so that, that is what I concluded in my first book. As so dharma of nature, what humans can nudge. Uh, so dharma of nature can influence and inspire dharma of humans. That will, by, by default, will take care of eco-dharma. What does that mean? Dharma of nature in the sense that what humans can nurture, learn from Vriksh Dharma, Agni Dharma, Prithvi Dharma, that physical characteristic of fire or tree or even earth or nature should inspire and has inspired humans living in India for millennia to live by principles of Dharma, human Dharma, that is Manushya Dharma. And because they're living by, with Dharmic principles for millennia, it has in turn taken care of the their dharmic duties towards nature. So one has, does not have to be very consciously or distinctly environmentalist in Indian context, in traditional Indian context. Being an environmentalist is a byproduct of living with dharmic principles for millennia. So for example, in, the, in my work, I show that Vishnois and Swadhyayis and other com communities in India, if they are protecting their flora and fauna in Rajasthan or Gujarat or elsewhere, it is not because they're environmentalist. It is because they follow the dharmic principles of ahimsa, non-violence, which reflects in their practice of vegetarianism, shakahari, right? So, so they are extreme. They take they they consider their flora and fauna, their trees, their river bodies, water bodies, their uh, animals and birds as part of their family, as part of their community. So it comes very natural for them to protect their flora and fauna, their wildlife, their plants, their trees, and so on, their water bodies, and so on. So these these are all intertwined. Natural phenomena, ec ecological phenomena, ethical principles, and spirituality is all intertwined. One does not know where spirituality stops and environmentalism begins or vice versa. Spirituality is environmentalism. Environmentalism is spirituality for these communities that live by dharmic principles such as Vishnuis and Swadhyayis and so on. That is the whole paradigm shift because if we, if we don't bring in spirituality or dharmic principles to study the, let's say, nature protecting community such as uh, Vishnois or others, we are missing out on the, the most essential phenomenon that inspire these communities to live by the principles that in turn result in protection of the environment. That is the summary of my argument for last uh, so many years. I've been saying these things and, and publishing these things. So that is what uh, I probably I can stop here and uh, take some questions now. This is what is my summary of my main argument. Uh, Professor Jain, for that very uh, insightful intervention, I think uh, that is something which is again at the core of understanding India. But what, how do we understand dharma, and how do we sort of uh, build our understanding based on this very key stone principle? And a lot of time that uh, what is pertinent and that you sort of mentioned that unless we understand this dharmic mindset, uh, it's impossible to understand India in the uh, 
sort of subsequently. And that is, I think, really interesting. I want to sort of, we had asked uh, uh, certain questions to our um, uh, viewers, to our readers, and they have replied. So we are taking a few questions from there. Uh, first one was very uh, interesting. It says that how far Indic perspective uh, is going to stand in this uh, capitalistic or materialistic world. I mean, we always see this dichotomy between materialism and capitalism. We also have some philosophical strands within Indian school of thought, which uh, sort of give primacy to materialism or uh, spiritualism at one end. So how do we sort of uh, see Indic thought contextualized in this broader dichotomy? Yes, for that question, I thought I'll start with this screen, this slide. Yeah, yeah. Where, uh, where what we see here, here is the two, two, last two millennia of economic history of the world, mm -hmm. where what we see from, let's say, year first year itself, right? 1 CE, from 1 CE to, uh, if we take a look at until 1820 CE, mm -hmm. we know that India's, India's share of the world's GDP was more than 20%, right? So if we combine yeah. China and India, China is red here and India is orange. We combine China and India, we see that more than 50% of the share of the world GDP was in the in was being controlled by China and India. So what I'm what we can conclude from this is that until until 1820, India mm -hmm. was a major economic power of the world, right? And the rest of the world was almost negligent. So right. what what we, what that shows us is that India's spirituality or dharmic principles, dharmic practices were not an imp impediment in India's economic growth or e trade uh, phenomena that India was having with across the world, India was trading with uh, as far back as Mesopotamia and Egypt and Rome and China and Southeast Asia, Indians were traveling all the way to Indonesia and so on. So economy is not an alternative to spirituality for, for Indian culture. As I was showing in my presentation that dharmic principles were Artha is part of dharma, right? So dharma, artha, kama, and moksha, that's four purusharthas. Artha is very much a part of dharma uh, or part of purushartha or Indian culture, as long as artha is being accomplished within the framework of dharma. So that uh, this, this graph itself shows that, that India was not spiritually, uh, economically weak, even though it was always ahead in spirituality and, 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 and dharma principles, right? So it's, it's not an either or phenomenon that economy versus spirituality or so yeah so that would be my response to that question right uh there is uh there was another very uh interesting question with regards to uh yoga and uh, this particular uh, person said uh, i'm forgetting the name but he said that uh how why yoga is so popular and not the other uh aspects of Indian civilization. For instance, you uh, delved on dharma, which is again a very central to it. But there is so much of philosophical diversity with regards to uh, philosophical thought. Uh, there is also uh, too much of thinking with regards to sciences. Yet that is not so popular. Uh, and what can we do in mm. order to popularize that uh, aspect of Indian value system also? Yes, yes, yes. So you want uh, to sort of stop sharing this? Uh, okay, or you, yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, that's pretty correct that yes, yoga is now global phenomenon, but not other, not many other principles or ideas or uh, philosophies from India. Right. Uh, I think the reason could be, and this is my two cents, we all have to you know keep thinking, I think my two cents would be that yoga when it was uh, incorporated into American culture, right? now no American health or fitness center can work without having some yoga class. There is yoga class in all YMCA's and all Jewish community centers and all kinds of fitness centers here. Right. So once it became an American popular, not just a counterculture, but main culture, pop culture uh, of America has, has embraced yoga like anything, right? So yoga has become a global phenomenon now. Eventually when and India also start, started uh, propose or thought of proposing it to United Nations that we should celebrate International Yoga Day. It is after that that the almost all entire world uh, immediately accepted it at the United Nations and they propose it to, to have it as an international phenomenon now June 15th. So I think two things are, are, are going on here. that The strength of India itself, our own self-confidence 
must be mm-hmm. a, must be demonstrated first that we believe and embrace our own philosophies wholeheartedly right not just right. yoga but other ideas also and, and and then the when the mainstream cultures of other countries other superpowers especially other major countries when they accept it as our strength reflects in other countries also i think also the the side by side what has been happening for last 25 years is the rise of indian diaspora right without mm-hmm. actively spreading any idea from in, uh, by us by indians living in the us by 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 some certain indirect uh, uh, processes ideas such mm-hmm. as vegetarianism ideas such as ayurveda and of course yoga they have spread because i think of the presence of the indian diaspora in in america also has played uh, mm-hmm. some role in in the in this spread of indian ideas because when i came to us in 1996 there were hardly any options for vegetarian food but now if even if i go to a remote village in new mexico or arizona or utah i can have your vegetarian food even in those remote villages that's a really interesting uh, development that i've seen in my own observation in right. the last 25 years in the us right right so why that has happened because uh, that could uh, you know in the diaspora must have or might have played a major role not consciously but indirectly because you know these things developed out of also out of market needs right mm-hmm. and also as indian economy is growing so people are looking for you know markets also to to sell their products so strength of india strength of indian diaspora mm-hmm. has helped spread in, in spread of some of these ideas as we grow further as we develop our own confidence further these things will will take their own course and it will develop eventually but first step is to have confidence in our own strength Right. right even in india right even in india there are hardly any universities or colleges or department where indian spirituality is being taught as an academic subject when we think of indian True. spirituality or religious studies or dharmic studies we think mm-hmm. of gurus right we think <laughs> of uh, maybe art of living maybe sadguru maybe other ashrams maybe uh, maybe other uh, missions and soram krishna mission and so on right. but we have not yet introduced these subjects as academic subjects within mainstream universities my university is a rare example uh, where i teach jainism mm-hmm. i teach hinduism and so on but we have to first charity begins at home we have to start teaching these subjects to our own students within india first then okay. you know it will take care of its own it will it, take its own ways and these idea will will spread and develop further within india and then eventually across the world interesting i think it's interesting you point that out because uh, while it, correct me if i'm wrong but this is sort of a later development that we sort of have uh, removed religious studies i'm using religion in a very uh, general sense mm-hmm. but these studies has been skewed out of the curriculum but we have had some very of uh, phenomenal scholars and academicians who were also sadhaks someone like mm-hmm. let's say uh, gurudev ranade or even to mm-hmm. certain extent uh, lokmanya tilak who could sort of mm-hmm. bring in religion and more. so some of these were hardly rooted in spirituality but were equally good academicians and somehow in mm-hmm. the process we sort of lost uh, it out and we do not uh, and we, it's important that uh, that is uh, sort of begins from the institutional level in schools and colleges where we teach it not just as a theology but something which is a, a, a to use a very loose expression a kind of a way of life if i if i'm mm. right yeah yeah right so that's what we have to bring it back yes true um there is an a uh, very very sort of interesting question from uh, nirmala samant who is associated with rishihood university uh she is asked it what is uh, the relevance of indian knowledge systems for the global challenges and i think you brought in ecology and how you know environmental sustainability obviously is a natural reflection for that but we generally talk about uh, uh, world peace uh, of course uh, a lot of leaders are talking about why philosophy and spirituality is going to lead towards that so is there any relevance i mean is, uh, how do we sort of connect indian knowledge systems or tradition to some of the global challenges which are pertinent today yeah i think you know we use these word world peace and uh, climate change so mm-hmm. it is just complete in my opinion just impossible to achieve any of these goals True. without taking indian principles indian knowledge systems really seriously without stopping the especially red meat consumption it is just impossible to tackle climate change without adopting reverence for nature reverence for sun and earth and trees and water and so on it is impossible to achieve 
uh, to stop climate change. Just, just impossible. There is no other way but to accept that, yes, trees are to be revered, nature is to be revered, earth is to be revered. And if we are using them, using any of the natural resources, we have to have utmost gratefulness, gratitude towards all the entire nature. Mm -hmm. So when, uh, let's say, indigenous people, let's say tribal people, in, in even in the US, there are native people and, and of course, indigenous people in India or, or communities such as Bishnois, if and when they are using some natural resources, they do it in an extremely sustainable ways with utmost grat gratitude. You know, take only whatever little that you need to take and then return it with to, to nature, maybe grow more trees. If you're cutting one tree, maybe plant more, 10 more trees and so on. So, and of course, red meat consumption, especially what probably it's a US term red meat, that is beef. Mm -hmm. If you don't stop beef consumption, there is absolutely no way we can stop climate change because what happens is that for beef to be consumed by Europeans or Americans, cattle are needed for beef, right? Mm -hmm. Cattle to be, cattle are to be, if cattle are to be raised for beef consumption, cattle needs food. That food comes at the cost, at a cost of tropical forest. So first tropical forests are replaced, are destroyed. Those forest land become farms, mm -hmm. farms that grow food for cattle. Then those cattle are butchered that beef, red meat, that beef comes to McDonald's or Burger Kings or all these all these restaurants and homes or grocery stores where beef is sold. So it's a whole chain of destroying first cattle, first killing cattle. Cattle in turn kills forests because the food comes at, at, from there, that land, right? So okay. the planet's health and then red meat, when it's once it is consumed by humans, it destroys human health also. So human health destruction is, is connected with planet's health destruction. Planet is being destroyed and human health is being destroyed. Again, this shows interconnection, which yeah. our people realize, Indians realize more than almost three millennia ago, probably there was beef consumption in ancient time also, maybe, or, or some animal consumption, animal sacrifice, maybe. Mm -hmm. But what we see now for last more than two millennia is even though animal sacrifice does happen at some Hindu temple, it's a rare phenomenon. Yes, there are some temples in Nepal, or even Rajasthan, my home state in Rajasthan, or in Bengal, or Kamakya temple in Assam, there are some animals being sacrificed in Kali temple in Kolkata, or Kamakya temple in Assam, or Rajasthan, as I said, or even in Nepal. So Hindus, even today, are doing some animal sacrifice, but that's a very, rare, very, very rare, almost extinct phenomenon. Largely, mm -hmm. the entire Hindu population across the world, more than 1 billion Hindu people, have com almost completely stopped animal sacrifices in their rituals, in their mm -hmm. in their daily consumption of food, even though some Hindus might be consuming meat, it's a very it's like a it's a it's not a must element of their food, which is what is happening in in US or Europe. If mm -hmm. Hindus are taking meat, that maybe it's, it's a, maybe once a day or once a week or once in three days or one, so many many days they will stop. Oh, it's a, it's a holy day. It's a somewhere hai aaj nahi khana hai ya shukrwar hai aaj nahi khana. I said there's so many self imposed disciplines by Hindus to minimize their meat consumption and completely stopping use of uh, sacrificing animals in their rituals. Mm -hmm. Something that must happen globally. That has okay. not yet happened. That is not yet. That is now happening slowly because of, as I was hinting, because of actually the red meat consumption in US is now at a, at a downward trend, which is good for, for the environment and also good for our own health or human health. Mm -hmm. But as it, it has to happen even more uh, at a, faster space to really take seriously to, to, to try to stop climate change and to try to stop, to try to take care of our own human health. So all these things are interconnected and right. you know, quicker, sooner we realize and start practicing better for our own health and for planet's health. Right. I mean, again, this is uh, very subtle and I think you also explained uh, how, you know, uh, Bishnoi communities, which you sort of alluded to in your... Uh, no, it's completely remarks. vegetarian community. Yeah. Bishnois. Uh, and and how they sort of also. yes right how how do they sort of see this as a dharma to sort of ensure that that balance between uh, the human life and the natural life sustains and that is sort of cultivated through certain um, practices traditions and that uh, that those traditions survive uh, as a sort of a living example of what dharma essentially is 
Mm -hmm. uh, which is, I think, you know, this sort of a very subtle way to sort of ingrain to explain a very intricate as uh, aspect of dharma through traditions, which can be accepted and sort of digested by common people. There is another very interesting question, and I think uh, uh, that is very coming from a, from a research assistant from in in Bhandarkar Oriental Research Institute. Her, her name is Anaga, and she's saying that what are her prospects as a student of uh, Indic studies? And, and this is now uh, been asked. Uh, and I, I think there are two as well. Of course, the, the question, the one who asked is not saying this, but I'm just sort of adding it up. But there are two aspects to this. There is at one level, there is an uh, sort of an uh, outburst in terms of understanding this new, uh, the government has sort of talked about Indian knowledge systems mm -hmm. in the uh, institutions that is coming up. But at another level, there is also some hesitance in the institutions to look at this as a proper academic format. There is also some hesitation among the accepted academic templates to, and there is also suspicion, skepticism to that. So there, the, the one who is researching or sort of getting into this new uh, discipline, so to say, uh, is also sort of quizzed by these. So how do we, how do you look at this pro new discipline emerging uh, and what it can contribute to academia as a whole. Yeah, I think if you really apply these Indic categories, for example, what I was showing in my presentation is not to use the word religion or category of religion, but to apply dharma because, again, it's an overarching principle to understand environmental practices, spiritual practices, and ethical principle, ethical practices of, of several communities in mm -hmm. across India. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's a it's at least a hint towards paradigm shift that let's not apply the Western categories to study Indian phenomena, mm -hmm. because in those those categories are really based on the Abrahamic theological principles. Because the word religion comes with the idea that there is one supreme God, and uh, that it seems to be controlling and judging us from heaven. Right, and being there is a prophet who comes with a scripture, and that becomes the principle for the entire community. None of these things apply for for India or for Japan or even China, or even African communities or native communities in America also, North America, South America. So indigenous communities across the world <laughs> don't really have this phenomenon of religion, right? because religion <laughs> is a very concrete, very uh, like a closed system. Right? Whereas <laughs> dharma in Indian context or Tao or Dao in Chinese right. context or Shinto in Japanese context and so on. These are the ex extremely open ideas. There is, there are multiple or infinite infinite deities, what are called as kamis in Japan. <laughs> so every tree is a kami. Every tree is a deity. Just as we have in India, every tree is to be revered. Right? Every particle is kan karme bhagwan. Every particle in the universe is to be revered. Very similar in Japan. Very similar in China. Very similar in many many indigenous communities across the world. So this is what we have to bring in into academia that we can't really make distinctions between uh, between uh, living by ethics, living by religion, living by spirituality, uh, or being environmentalist. Right. All right. So to a student, to a new, to coming back to your question, your question by your uh, by your audience, that if we really have to do something innovative in academia. <laughs> We don't really have to reinvent the wheel. We just have to go back to how people are living, people are studying, people are, people have been researching, people have been writing, studying for millennia in India and even other cultures. Right? So how how did they arrive at the word at the phenomenon of shunya? Yeah. They were not scientists who rejected religion, right? So yeah. in, in in my colleagues used to say in uh, I think in uh, Iowa or, or or even in Texas that. Athens and Jerusalem were always in conflict in the West. So philosophy and religion were on, in conflict. In other words, science and religion were in conflict for much of Western history, but okay. not in India or Indian context, right? Where Bhaskaracharya is an Acharya, okay. but who also gave us many scientific and mathematical principles, Aryabhat and so many other Madhvacharya and so many others, right? Okay. So if really uh, if new student in india or student of indology any you know coming from any ethnicity or any background if they have to do something innovative they have to simply think from these these paradigms which do not make any distinctions or boundaries or barriers mm -hmm. as in ancient times they were 
they were spiritual at the same time they were very philo extremely philosophical scientific and so on so that is the that is the way to develop it uh, and and like i was suggesting dharma or dharmic paradigm can okay. be very helpful in in promoting these paradigm in promoting this paradigm shift and so any student of uh, in, indology or, or or even indian anthropology sociology must start with first taking a lesson in indian philosophy where we see that dharma or, or dharmic interpretation are are so wide ranging so diverse yet so similar across buddhism jainism or charvaka which is the gnostic philosophies or astic philosophies uh, the six vedanta and so on uh, mimamsa and so on so they must start with that that will help them open up their boundaries and that should be the prerequisite even for sociology anthropology or other other fields what happens today in india or even outside india when they are studying anything about india they directly jump into indian history or indian uh, sociology or anthropology without really understanding uh, without applying indian philosophical ideas to study sociology or anthropology or history Okay. that has to change i think that can be really helpful to take first with indian philosophy start with indian philosophy at least have some background that how okay. indians have been thinking and trying to interpret their own culture from these lang from these angles from these lenses i think okay. that can be helpful yeah. and that okay. will make them hopefully more innovative and something innovative they can contribute towards understanding india otherwise we are just repeating same old colonial same old colonial uh, uh, conclusions and okay. even after independence we have been applying marxist categories or uh, european other european categories that really don't do any justice to indian phenomenon right and in that sense i mean now of course there is a lot of coinage or there is a lot of currency to the interdisciplinary studies but that is something which has always been uh, very much part of uh, indian knowledge systems traditionally i mean there was no uh, watertight compartments you have to mm -hmm. the you know like you said the spiritualist was also an equally good scientist mm -hmm. uh, was also an equally good poet uh, at times mm -hmm. uh, so this interesting finally i i just have a last question which i think will help sum up the entire a uh, discussion that we are having and i think that is something which we want we also connect with and that is this question is a uh, uh, sort of very significant in the sense that the person mm -hmm. asks what we as an individual can do uh, to promote indic studies and encourage mass participation of uh, of people in understanding you know this is coming from uh, shrimati ganga jay kumar uh, who is saying that what we as an individual can do uh, so of course as an academia we can always do that but how do we sort of take it to mass level uh, as a if i may say as a part of leaving itself yeah i guess what you're doing as me mom the foundation or so many other universities have now started in the last 5 10 years so many foundations have come up so many people right. even in america and and european countries they are all trying to promote alternative paradigm indic paradigms dharmic yeah. paradigm so i'm using indic and dharmic almost interchangeably right. anonymously right. because indic phenomenon in my opinion cannot be understood without dharma right? so dharmic paradigm or indic paradigm is what we have to promote and uh, and it one thing is i think people become a bit hesitant in applying dharmic word even as a word or even as a paradigm is i think they right. they, they start seeing it as a in opposition with minorities in india in my opinion even minorities in india cannot be untouched with the dharmic paradigm even oh. they are different even minorities in india are living in india for centuries mm -hmm. and it is no way possible that even they are not influenced by some of the dharmic ideas at least you know True. some of their practices behaviors and i i mean we have to study it more deeply are the minorities in india different from their counterparts let's say in the middle east or in in the european western countries that somebody has mm -hmm. to more study more carefully and more deeply but overarching majority across india and across china japan also you know going forward i, I we should say that that uh, their style of working style of living by ethical principles the mm -hmm. style of spirituality how unique it is and how important it is to study from their own categories rather than applying european categories yeah right right does that answer your question or sure it does i mean so what we, what we should yeah. do okay, one you know one more thing I, if i may add is that we have to not just as a hobby you know what happens is that you know 
I'm a, I'm an engineer or doctor for the main for my career. Mm-hmm. And as a side hobby, I do some I do some I will read some one or two or three or four books, and I start calling it my myself as an Indologist. That is extremely dangerous. That is to be mm-hmm. that is not to be. Mm-hmm. If you really are serious about promoting and studying India, we have to make sure that at the undergraduate level, we take Indian philosophy, we sure. take it as a major, our major career focus, as a major minor in, in terms of our mm-hmm. courses, but also yeah. as a major focus in our life. So, you know, yes, we have to promote Indic studies, we have to promote Indology, but somebody else, not my kids, my kids will become engineer or doctor, <laughs> but somebody else will do Indology. So that has to stop. Indology has to become a mainstream career by every family, every child in India, if really, really serious. That mm-hmm. should be the first step, right? So it it cannot be it, it cannot be that you know I my career is for money making uh, uh, I uh, practices, but as a side, as a, on a weekend, I go to listen to a guru, and that is end of my spirituality. That that, that cannot really help. I, what if right. really are serious? We have, it has to become our career, right? More and more colleges and universities must start teaching it at undergraduate level. Our kids should take those courses that they, they should do BA or MA or PhD in Indology. And that hopefully will help in establishing more depart, department across India. Mm-hmm. Where there is an, now we need a major number of people who are experts in Indology from Indic categories by realizing and practicing some of these principles in their daily lives and in their academic practices. That will be a true a true renaissance of, I think, true. Indology of Indic studies across India and across the world. Interesting. I think uh, that note, I think it sums up our discussion today. And it begins, as you rightly said, by understanding what is dharma and how it sort of becomes uh, that uh, explaining explaining idea of what Indian civilization is. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Jain, very much for taking out time and being with us for this second uh, Justice Rana Memorial Lecture. We really appreciate that. And I'm sure uh, all our viewers would have had a better idea as to what we all need to do uh, in order to start understanding India. And I think the very basic is to explain ourselves and to others what dharma really is and how it is uh, something which is very significant to understand India. So thank you uh, all of you for joining us. Do let us know in uh, in the comment section how you like this video, what are <clears throat> what is uh, what is it that we should be doing uh, and what is it that uh, should come as uh, that, that should come as significant uh, aspect of understanding India. So please comment on this. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to visit our website. Um, it, uh, it contains all the research articles that we publish at Mimamsa's website. Uh, it will also have all the other details with regards to what uh, Mimamsa Foundation for Indic Studies is doing and is uh, uh, is up to. So visit us at www.bharatmimamsa.com uh, and also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Uh, with that note, I uh, once again want to thank uh, Professor Jain for uh, delivering this very insightful lecture. we also I also want to thank uh, Ranade Realtors for generously supporting this Justice Ranade Memorial uh, Lecture Initiative. Uh, with that, thank you and uh, see you soon.